Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Peter, recovered alcoholic. Yeah. Uh, I feel very important behind this thing here. Um, <laughs> now, with respect to the seating, the people on this side of the room and the people on that side of the room can stare at the people in the middle of the room. Um, okay, this is, I don't know who to talk to. <laughs> I'm in a Jewish temple, I'm sounding Jewish. I'm here <laughs> All right, we'll talk. Uh, my name is Peter, recovered alcoholic. Uh, grateful to be here, and uh, thank you guys for having me um, share my experience, strength, and hope on this work. Um, the work out of the big book and where it's taken me and where I've landed so far and what my current experience is. Um, God separated me from alcohol June 23, 1988, and what I look like then uh, internally, what I look like now internally is completely different. Um, externally, I've changed a whole bunch too. Uh, aged and um, have been beat up in recovery a few times and um, gotten a whole bunch more gray hair. Um, but um, I've been able to take care of myself in the 25 years or so that I'm sober. And uh, it's interesting. I see occasionally some folks um, online or some folks I run into who... Um, I'll live in a civilian life who are my age, and they look a lot older. And there's something about Alcoholics Anonymous, because I've spoken to many over the years, including my teachers who were, you know, in their 70s in Alcoholics Anonymous and living this life, and there's something very youthful about us, something very spirited about us. And uh, it all comes from what's going on in the inside that manifests outward. On June 23, 1988, when God separated me from booze uh, and some other things, uh, mostly booze, um, I looked and felt like a man of 100 years old. And if I live to be 100, I'll never be as old as the day I walked into AA. Things were certainly different. My conceptions, perceptions about life, about God, about Alcoholics Anonymous, can I stay sober? The voice in the head was always telling me, who are you kidding? You'll never, you, you'll never amount to anything. Uh, you'll never stay sober. Let's get drunk and get it over with. And that has changed dramatically because that voice doesn't talk to me like it used to, but it does talk occasionally. A few weeks ago, I talked about this image we try to keep. The first is the image for the masses, the, the image I want to show everyone, how I'm doing. Let everyone know I'm praying. Let everyone know I'm spiritual. Let everyone know I dress nice. Let everyone know that I'm okay. And I do that because I'm really not okay on the inside. And it seems like the more facade we put out there, it usually determines how insecure I am, really am. And then there's this other image, the, the voice we play to that tells us uh, we're no good. And we play to the voice in the head and we, we, we try to overcompensate because a voice in the head tells me I'm, I'm nothing. I'm still a drunk. I'm still a bum. And it goes on and on. Who are you kidding? And so what I would tend to do, many of us tend to do, is go out there and take the world by storm. Make lots of money. Buy the best clothes. Buy the biggest car. Do all these external things. And really what I'm dressing up is something that's very broken. And no matter how much I put on it, no matter how much stuff I accumulate, I still feel empty at the end of the day when I put my head on the pillow. And something happens in the spiritual transformation, not education, but the spiritual transformation, that we don't need much. Through adversity, we learn to let go of the things we thought we needed to be happy. And sometimes when we're in Alcoholics Anonymous and we're growing and understanding and affecting this, we are put to the grindstone many times. Some people will call it tested. Some people will call it spiritual growth. I don't believe in God testing me. If you do, that's great. I just think we meet life as it is. And we find out we can no longer live life on life's terms. We fail miserably. And it's the crossroads. And I've had many crossroads where, am I going to surrender to God or not? What happens is when the external world looks good, we take credit for it. And really what it does is throw me into believing self-reliance work. I'm a man's man. I've made my mark. And it's all false. It's all built on, like, on, on very weak legs. 
Because as soon as a thunderbolt hits, I have no way to turn. Remove something from the external world, and I'm down on my knees again wondering what happened. And what happens, what has happened for me is, as my external world collapsed in, in recovery, I found myself being driven back to God. And it, I came to a, a very uh, a clear, uh, rude awakening realization that no matter what the outside world looks like, I'm still broken on the inside, and that's where the repair has to be done. And the only way I'm going to get repaired on the inside is with the touch of God's hand. In his time, in his way, and it's none of my business what he's going to make me into, where he's going to lead me, where my mission is. None of my business. My business is to surrender to my, at my altar and say, okay, I'm ready. Wherever it goes, it goes. It has to be better than what I've done. Very often people ask me, why do you say the Lord's Prayer when we do the Lord's Prayer? You don't say it with everyone else. Oh, I'm saying the Lord's Prayer. But that's between me and God. There's something that has resonated with me from some from another book that I don't need to prove to anyone I'm praying. It's nice to pray in unison and out loud. There's power in that. But I don't need to do that. And just as for me to show you I'm praying or you I'm praying, look at me, I'm praying the Lord's Prayer. I'm Moses. This is between me and my Creator. He knows I'm praying three times a day. He knows the work I do. So I keep it between He and I, because that is the relationship at the end of the day between you and God, not you, the masses, and God. We came here alone. We're going out alone. How am I doing in the middle? Is God, am I practicing fidelity to God? Is God like on the sidelines and when I need Him, I turn to God and I surrender? Oh God, I need you. And soon as I get some juice back, now God comes third or fourth on the list. Or is it the most important thing in my life? Most important relation, most important event in my life is everything to do with God. Now if you're new, group of drunks for good only direction is good enough. Our own conception of books is no matter how limited was sufficient to make the approach that God doesn't make too hard terms. So AA has been very wise. They, 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 they encourage us to go back to our religious communities in step 11. But they know at the beginning, if they threw religion out, they lose half of us. So whatever our conception is, no matter how limited, it's sufficient to make the approach. Group of drunks for good only direction. When I was new, I would sit next to the old timers. They were my higher power. It was tangible. And somewhere there's a crossover, there's a transformation where we still love the sacredness of AA. We still look to sit next to another drunk. A rotten cup of coffee in an old, ugly basement and for an AA meeting is the best place I can be. Sitting around some, some old timers. And I still love that. I still worship my fellowship. But I go home with me. I wake up with me. I go to work with me. I'm around me all day long. I can't get away from me. Or how am I doing when I'm in my own company? And I found that going to AA meetings is a band-aid on an open wound, but doesn't treat that brokenness. We all got that it hurts somewhere, every one of us. We all got that where does it hurt, and we can list a whole bunch of things. Some of us will swallow hard when the question is asked, where does it hurt? And we could be sitting in AA for a long time, and we still got that piece of it hurts, and it's never been remedied, it's never been reconciled, never been healed. Because I tried, we tried lots of other things to get the healing, and we, and we rarely turn back to God. In fact, we treat humans like God and God like a human. I'll turn to the meeting, I'll turn to my sponsor, all good things. I'll turn to a new job, make more money, all good things. Because I really don't believe God is going to heal it. And my turn to God is like kind of skepticism and doubt. Now, if you knew that's okay, if you're around here a while, how come? And one of the neat things that this work's going to do, and we'll find out more as we, as we sit in step five and, and deliver our fourth step, we find out what God is by finding out what God is not. We find out who we be by finding out who we are not. It's a process of removal that this, 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 this 12 steps does. There's no addition in the 12 steps in my experience. When I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I thought I had to acquire stuff and get stuff. First, I had to get the superstar sponsor. That was number one. So I can tell you, Joe Blow's my sponsor, so you think I'm great. That's playing to the crowd again. I need someone else to validate me. And it's interesting. I went to a couple of stars in, when I was in Brooklyn, a couple of the gurus, and all of them refused me. They were too busy. They didn't want to. It was a lot of window dressing with some of these men. They'd sound great at the podium. 
But during a business meeting or you see them out in the street, they, they didn't look like that. And God kept getting in my own way to prevent me from hurting myself some more. So the, the few superstars in there I went to, God said no. And then one night I was given a talk and I'm praying, God, please show me a teacher. I'm praying. And this guy gives a talk and that voice said, now go ask him. And he was brutal. He was not a star. He was, he was like a, a grumpy AA guy. The reason why he was grumpy, because he was fed up with the middle of the road AA. He couldn't believe he walked into an AA meeting and heard people say, the big book workshop, don't drink and go to me, he had it up to here. And he voiced his opinion. And that's the teacher I got. He didn't care about my feelings. He didn't care about my issues. He didn't care about my dysfunctional family. He cared about one thing. Peter Marinelli, you're dying. God gave me you to save. And that's what he did. And he was one of the first men that showed me we can read this book all day long. I can study the big book all day long. I know some guys in AA or like big book lawyers. They will tell you where the commas are, where the periods are. They will tell you everything. They know what Bill Wilson drank in 1939 for, you know, in the afternoon. I mean, they know everything. You don't want to break bread with these folks. Because when they get out there, they're womanizing, they're lying, cheating, and stealing. I sponsored a few like that. But he talked about having the transformation that the information in this book gives us. And we know who we are. We know who we are. We can play the AA game, but we know who we are once we leave. Am I in contact with my sponsor regularly? Or do I have a sponsor name only? Am I doing what the book asks me to do with respect to inventory and prayer and meditation? Sponsoring other people? Am I currently living in all three sides of the triangle? We need to get the ground rules right before we even start. Am I clear that I have, that all my reservations have been taken from me? No lurking notion that somehow someday I'll be immune to booze. Am I down on my knees and completely broken? That's a great place to start. That's where I started. I was in serious trouble when I got here in 1988. So when it gave me the considerations in step one, it was a little bit of ed education, but more of a transformation for me, realizing now I know what's wrong with me. I can't fix anything, let alone me. And regardless of how good it looks out there, I'm still going to drink. I'm going to drink if I hit Powerball. I'm going to drink if I'm homeless. I'm drinking. That's what I do. Even right now, tonight, that's what I do. I drink. And the only thing that's going to prevent me from that is God, who will eventually kind of pluck out that little piece that says it's okay to drink. There's a healing that goes on. There's metanoia, which all poured out. There's a purging with a depth of self. And what, what we get is a renewal, a God mind, where I'm now seeing and hearing and speaking with God's words, God's eyes, God's ears, which means who I'd be is completely different. It's a new person. I can't tolerate the old Peter anymore. Even my early years in AA when I was doing okay, I look back and I see how deaf, dumb, and blind I was to so many things. What relationships should be like. I had it mixed up what a friend is and what an acquaintance is. I thought if you said hello to me, we're friends. <laughs> because I was so insecure about me and such low self-esteem and so broken. Somebody validate me. Not the beginning, that's the way it is. Because we are in serious trouble when we get here. Some of us don't realize how serious but if I'm around here a little while and I've been exposed to all this information and I'm still twisted up, no crime in that, but why? Because there's no need for it. Not Alcoholics Anonymous. And the neat thing that this has done is driven me further into God. It seems like in my life in recovery, when things got really bad, when things were completely falling apart, my, the, the instinct, the intuitiveness was just to go back to God one more time. Thank God I went back to God one more time rather than trying another avenue to fix myself. And I got, I, I've shared this in terms of I like nice things. I will never deny that. I like nice things. But the difference is I don't need nice things anymore. I want a safe home, I want a loving relationship, and I want to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't need to speak. I know some folks who need to speak. I don't need to speak at a podium. If God says your career at speaking is done, I'd be okay sitting there listening to someone else because I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm just glad that he's taken all the deceitfulness and dishonesty and the treachery that I, and the hate that he used to walk around with and given me something that felt very vulnerable at the beginning. That was compassion and love, tolerance for others, acceptance of others. Trying to understand someone who is sick and suffering rather than assassinating them. 
That's vulnerability. That's scary. Love is scary. Compassion is scary. But it's the things that God gave me and you when we first got here. Not to AA when we were first born. You look at a newborn, they have love and compassion. They don't care what you dress like. They don't care if you're heavy, skinny, short, tall, black, white. They don't care. Just love me. I'll love you back. Unconditional. We can learn more from watching a two-year-old than we can people in AA 40 years sober. Most of us are like, I love you unconditionally on the conditions you meet all my conditions. <laughs> no, that's marriage. Hold it. That's marriage. <laughs> I began this work really out of desperation uh, when I got back from Minnesota. Um, after six months of being in AA, I was, I was still very sick. I had a little education, a little bit of a transformation, enough to keep my head above water, but I was lacking a lot. I was missing a lot, and I thought I had to acquire things. I thought I had to go out there and make money like a man's supposed to be rich. A man's supposed to have power. A man's supposed to have control. Fear nothing. And I found that I was doing, I had none of it. I had no money. I couldn't get a good job. I was afraid of everything. I'm not a fighter. What do I do? I'm afraid to be in relationships. I'm failing miserably as a man. And God was just keeping me right size. And so instead of acquiring things, some wonderful people in AA says, you need to go in. And in the process of going in, everything gets removed. It's subtraction, never addition on this path. Take a look at the steps. Step one gets me really clear that anything I do blows up. Self-reliance doesn't work. Anything I try to control or, or shape or form or manipulate will blow up. And usually means I'm going to drink at some point over because I'm an alcoholic. Step one says I'm drinking. I will mismanage the most precious gift on my own power. God will give me a wonderful relationship and I will screw that up. Not because I'm an evil person, because I just don't see the world the way God does. And when we have a transformation, we start little by slowly to see things a little bit different, perhaps with God's eyes. And we start to love and appreciate simple things. Like waking up on a Sunday morning and having breakfast. Because I remember waking up on Sunday morning very sick with no money and hadn't eaten in a couple of days. I say, thank you, God, for some breakfast. Thank you, God, for a fresh cup of coffee. Thank you, God, I'm about to take a shower and clean myself. And I slept in a bed that's clean next to someone I know. <laughs> hmm? that stuff is very clear to me and as I stopped moving through this process God kept removing it he would give me some things that were always present and remove everything I thought I needed through adversity we learned to let go of the things we thought we needed to be happy all the things I thought made a man were removed. All the things I thought were God were not God. In fact, even now, anything I come with my mind and, and think is God is not God because it's coming from my mind. This great power can only be experienced, and we will experience it in abundance. We will experience lots of God. But anything my mind tells me, this is God, this is not God, has only come from my mind, so it's wrong. I mean, I grew up God as a white guy, with gray hair, with a beard, and lives in a cloud somewhere. God couldn't be any other color than white. I don't even know if God has a color. I don't even know. But we can experience his love and his mercy, his compassion. We'll find out when we cross over. So the process of recovery is always about removal, never addition. It's subtraction all the time. That doesn't feel good. That's when we start to run. As soon as things start to get removed from me, things I thought I needed, thought things I wanted, things I'll hold on to, and my wants get dressed up as needs all the time, that stuff starts to happen, usually in step four, when we're taking stock of ourselves. And we're doing one, two, and three, and our sponsor is directing and guiding us, saying, stay away from this, you need to do more of that. We don't like to do that, it's removal, and we feel really sick about it. We feel like we're dying because the ego is getting grinded into dust. And it isn't until we start to experience a little bit of humility that I get and you get to realize how much ego-driven we were. When we start to experience some ease and comfort, we realize, even in sobriety, how much dis-ease and discomfort we're walking around with. When the voices in the head finally shut down, even for five minutes, we realize we've been entertaining Yankee Stadium. A thousand voices running around the head. 
and we entertain all of them. It would be as if all of you started talking to me right now at once, answering, ask me questions, and I'm trying to answer everyone at the same time and get into a deep conversation with you while he's asking me questions, she's asking me questions, they're criticizing me, I'm arguing with everyone. That's madness. You ever go, sometimes you see these less fortunate people who are walking down the street talking to the voices, the arguing, and we say, wow, they're nuts. We do the same thing. It's inside. We're not going to yell out voices. We're arguing and cursing on the way here. Who drove to this meeting alone tonight? Show of hands. How many people drove? Okay, every one of you guys are lying. I'm going to tell you why. If you think about, just for a second, reflect on the drive over here. How many people were you guys talking to in your car when you were the only one in the car? Right? Talking to the ex-wife, the future ex-wife, <laughs> the mother-in-law. That's always a good one. Right? You're just arguing. Maybe things from 20 years ago. And you go back and forth. You argue with these people in the car. There's no one in the car. <laughs> Now, when you go back in the car, guess who's waiting for you? All those people. <laughs> so when we get just a little bit of quiet, a little bit of stillness, we realize how much activity we got going on. That's why when you ask an alcoholic, how are you doing? He says, oh, I'm tired. Yeah, because you've been talking to 4,000 people all day long. <laughs> right? All day long. It doesn't stop. So step two, I looked at this, this, this pointed to the solution that this power is going to give me right mindedness, wholeness of mind, truth, sanity, where the very things I had to run to are the things I'm repelled by now. I'm not doing that. I'm looking at life truthfully. Now, that isn't always pleasant. Waking up is a wonderful thing, but on the way, it'll annoy us. It'll get us uncomfortable. It will disturb us. The process of recovery is a disturbing one, unless we're a sociopath. It doesn't feel good. And having to, to know that I need, I must surrender everything to this power, we turn all things into the Father of light presides over us all. We must be rid of self, my book tells me. Self-reliance doesn't work. Over and over and over again, my book tells us, self don't work, go to God. That's a bitter pill for some of us to swallow. But once we start to do that, do that, we start to experience this power, something happens. We realize how sound asleep we were in Alcoholics Anonymous. So do I want to go? Yes, and I make a decision in three. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Our third step decision. And that's all it is, is a decision. That I'm willing to live on someone else's, uh, uh, by someone else's rules. Am I willing to live along the lines of someone else's rules and not mine anymore? Because that's what step three is telling us. I'm going to get out of the driver's seat and God's going to drive. And I can never put my hands back on a wheel again unless I want to crash. Am I willing to play by someone else's rules? Am I willing to live on terms other than my own? It's an easy answer if we think back to, based on my experience, how's that been working for me? How have I been doing? Playing by my rules. Because when I play by my rules, you have to follow my rules. Everyone in this room has to follow my rules. And if you don't, I gossip about you. I become resentful. I become afraid of you. And at some point, I need a drink to get away from it all. I'm an alcoholic. Did a searching, fearless, and moral inventory in step four that could not be accomplished without God's help. I, I shared about step four last week, and I would try to write inventory without prayer, and I find myself struggling, and I was getting sick. I would try to write inventory without prayer, and suddenly I'd become really hungry and had to eat before I write. I would try to write inventory without prayer, and I would be dishonest. I would maybe fall asleep. I'd find other things to do. And I was writing, but I wasn't in. I was marking a little time. Now, because I went through the first three steps in a book, I had a little bit of awakening. Just something, some, some, something happening with me, but I knew this was not good. And I called my sponsor, and he read me the riot act over the phone. He was without mercy. I mean, he was brutal. That was how he worked. And he says, your life is none of your business, and you need to go to God to put this stuff on paper, because on your own, we, us, you, can't be searching fearless and moral. Don't even attempt it. And so I surrendered once again, and I asked God to allow me to be searching fearless and moral. And I began to write, and I began to write, and write, 
and write and write. And the pen became the spiritual translator. It was just something that was coming out of me that I had no control over. I'd write for an hour, two hours, and three hours, and then I'd stop exhausted and get prayer and go to bed. And I'd stay home from meetings at night because my sponsor said, if you're writing and missing a meeting, that's okay. And I missed a couple of meetings during the week, but I'd write my fourth step, and suddenly it was done in like a week and a half. Done. Because I was, I was still in that place that the fire was on my butt. I knew if I relapse, I'm dead. And it wasn't even only that. It was the pain and misery that I left behind because I suffer when I'm out there. I go homeless. I panhandle. I don't bathe. I didn't want any of that anymore. So I kept writing. And God kept pushing the pen, and I was done. Now, when I got done with my fifth, uh, fourth step, my sponsor said, okay, we're going to sit for step five. And then suddenly, I wish he would get sick. <laughs> Call in with the flu. That day of the appointment. I didn't want to go. I trusted my sponsor at the beginning. I thought he walked on water. I thought he invented AA. He was a guru to me. Until he said, come to my house Saturday morning when I do our fifth step. Then in my mind, that same mind said, well, who is this guy anyway? <laughs> you don't know him anything. All these AA people want to know your business. Why? We, why you? And sex inventory is not getting. It started. It started. And really out of fear and desperation, I remember uh, 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 I was living with my kid brother. I hit my knees. And off I went to his house. I knocked on the door. And we sat down on the first session, was on his couch, and uh, I started reading. I had like five spiral notebooks of a fourth step. I still think back to the work God gave me, the ability to do. It still boggles my mind how I was able to do that kind of work. And I sat with my sponsor. We made some prayer. He had some religious articles out. Uh, we meditated for a few minutes, and he says, off you go. And he said, what's the one thing before we started? He said, what's the one thing that you don't want to tell me? And I couldn't think of anything until I got to six sections. It was a whole chapter I didn't want to tell him. And we began. And he had a notepad out. He had a big book out, and he had a pen. And he told me, I only want you to read to me what you put on paper, because that's God-inspired. If you start talking about what you wrote, it's ego-inspired. You're trying to cover your tracks a little bit. Like, this is what we do. Here's an image of it. Let me explain what happened. I'm covering. My ego's breathing again. So I read what was on paper, and so many times I wanted to say, let me explain what happened here. He didn't allow me. Occasionally, he would ask me, okay, tell me about this. But I had to read what was on paper, and that's what I did. And I started purging all this stuff, and he would take some notes. The notes he was taking were the, the, common, the, the common defects that kept switching hats throughout my life. Fear disguised a hundred different ways. Greed disguised a hundred different ways. Hate disguised a hundred different ways. And he would go maybe two-thirds into it and said, I want to show you something. All this stuff was going on at your first page of inventory. We're like, you know, so much later into this book, two-thirds into your inventory. You have the same stuff going on. This is years and years of it. Different people, different places, same you. Is it them or is it you? I got to take stock of me right there. It wasn't the people. Unmanageability is an internal condition, never an external one. Regardless of what you're doing, it may be unacceptable, I may not like it, but it shouldn't disturb me in here. When I'm disturbed in, in here, it's because there's something wrong in here. Am I in a position of neutrality, safe and protected, regardless of what's going on? Really test our spiritual muscles then. Or do I get disturbed by what everyone does, what everyone says, how they critique me, even constructive criticism? Oh my God, what bondage. And I got to look at that. That wasn't pleasant. And when we got done, he handed me all this information. And I got some instructions what to do. It was a whole bunch of uh, defects of character that kept showing up. And he gave me instructions as to what to do with this work when I got to 6 and 7. Now, I've been able to go through the work a whole bunch of times. My first... I want to say about 10 years or so in AA, I was one of those folks who went through the steps one time and one time only, and that was the belief system. And some folks still do that, and I, if that works for you, great. I, I'm not here to cha uh, change you, but I will challenge. I went through the work one time, one time only, and I hit a wall 
in AA, I was starting to flatline a little bit. I was doing all the work I was asked, but I needed something different. I needed to grow an understanding and effectiveness, and things started to become very mechanical. And I'm wondering what's wrong with me. I start to point fingers. I start to get a little disease and discomfort. Ego is starting to reemerge. When the ego reemerges, it never tells you I'm reemerging. What it does is say they're wrong and you're right. We start to critique people around us, criticize people around us, leave meetings early because I don't like this. Little things were going on. I became restless here and discontented. I had a sponsor doing all the work. What's wrong? I needed a new experience. And I met with the greatest teacher in my life, a gentleman from Texas. And the first thing, Simon, he gave me was something called a lay aside prayer. And that was, God, please let me lay aside everything I think I know about the big book, 12 steps, AA and you, God, for an open mind and new experience. God, please let me see my truth. Soon as I start to, if I was, if, if I went to James, say James sponsored me, and we went to his house tonight, and we started the work tonight. Everything I've gotten that God has given me up until tonight now stands in the way of a new experience. So what I need to do is take all of it and put it on another bookshelf and start new, open mind, new experience, lay everything aside. When I get somewhere in 9, 10, 11, and 12, all that will meet me on the back end. But as soon as I start to go through the work, it was in the way, and Mark told me we need to work with this lay-aside prayer. Some of us call it the set-aside prayer, and I did. I was just as desperate with about 10 or 11 years sober as I was at day one. Because I wanted, and I needed God, and I couldn't get that, couldn't get over the wall. I didn't know what to do. What I needed was a new experience, get some new information, revisit step one, touch my current unmanageability, see where I am with God. Am I turning all things into God or the things that are easy to turn to God? What's that look like? Any outstanding amends I haven't made that I still have? All of these pieces of the puzzle. You ever do one of those jigsaw puzzles? They got like a thousand pieces, maybe as big as your fingernail. It's insignificant at the beginning, right? And when you complete the puzzle and you're missing that piece... You go look for the piece because the puzzle's not complete. A little inventory, a little prayer meditation at the beginning says, oh, that's step. What's the big deal? It is a big deal. It is a huge deal. It's all parts of the puzzle that need to be put together. And only God's going to do it. I go through the work with Mark. And uh, I remember I asked him, can you sponsor me? So I've been waiting for you. And I still to this day don't know why he said that and what he saw in me. But the eyes of the windows to the soul, he saw something was not right with about 10 or 11 years sober. Something was missing. Not terribly wrong, but not really right. There was pain. There was some suffering. There was that thing that I wasn't addressing. I had been in therapy now for like five, six years by the time I met Mark. I was doing it all, but I hit a wall. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to uncover, discover, and discard these new things that were in my way. Because God will reveal to me. God will reveal to us when His time, when it's right to be revealed. So I couldn't settle on going through the work one time. Now, trust me, when I was sitting in an AA meeting and people would talk about reworking the steps regularly, one through nine, once a year, I had lots of contempt for that. What I had was contempt prior to investigation. How do I know? And we began to work, and something electric happened to me in step three. I was in step three. My sponsor called me, and I couldn't talk fast enough because something was going on. I didn't know it was God. I just thought I was feeling excited about AA again. He knew it was God. And he says, Peter, you didn't even get to your fourth step. Isn't this great? Then he hung up the phone. <laughs> And I blew through my fourth step, and I sat with him in five, and it's the first time I did multiple fifth steps. I had to sit with this this guy, Mike L., in Orange, New Jersey, uh, South Orange, New Jersey, and then Mark was in town, and I sat with Mark, and I did multiple fifth steps. Our book says personal persons. And the spiritual law, the more people on this path who know about me, the freer I am. So if I sit with a couple of big book people who understand what I'm about to do here and get it, and I share with them, then I go to my sponsor, I'm freer. How free do we want to be? If I'm sitting here in bondage tonight, why don't you want to be free? If I'm experiencing freedom tonight, I like the effect produced by freedom. I want to get more free. I love more booze. I want to get more free. And he was right. And I sat with Mark, and I'm one of those guys. I've gone through the work three, four times in one year. 
Not repeating the same thing over on paper, just new experience, taking a look at things, finding out what amends I didn't, wasn't even aware of that had to be made. And what it does, one through nine clears out self, and I get rocked right into 10 and 11 with a new experience, a new state of consciousness in 10 and 11, a deeper level of consciousness. I start to feel that I'm known by my creator. Something happens that words don't, it can't really express, but it's a feeling in here. Everything changes. Everything changes. Suddenly you go in your backyard and say, wow, the grass is really green. I never saw it before. I'm married. I have kids. I never knew they were here before. <laughs> you know? Everything changes. And whenever I got disturbed by the information a teacher or a sponsor gave me, it's because my ego was in the way. And I don't want to admit that. I'll find fault with you for telling me what to do. I will criticize you for telling me what to do. I will gossip about you for telling me what to do until I get to the other side and say, thank, thank, thank you for hitting me right here with the truth. So interesting things in step five. I just want to go over. It says into action, not into 90 meetings in 90 days. Not into hanging out because I did my four step, into action. So if I go to gym, I have to take some action to get in shape. I can't go to the gym and sit down and smoke a cigar and expect to get in shape. So into action, I need to do some work here. Now the ego wants no part of this fifth step because it knows it's about to commit suicide. The ego wants no part of step five because it knows it's about to die. And the self doesn't want any part of this because it knows it's about to die. Because for me, I've, I've been walking around with this false self and the self that God created. And the false self is dressed up in all external things. The false self doesn't want God. The false self is God. How can I meet God when I'm God? How can I experience God when I'm, I'm God? And the fifth step is about to dismantle the whole thing. Just pull it out, root, root and branch. It says, having made our personal inventory, what shall we do about it? We've been trying to get a new attitude. Different view of God. Not so much contempt. A little bit more enlightened about God. And a new relationship. One that's pure. One that's not blocked. A new relationship. We may have had a relationship. We're going to have a new one. Always new. Always growing. Maybe we had group of drunks for good only direction. We're going, to, we're going to have no more duality. We're going to experience oneness with God. The great reality deep down within. We're about to step onto a path that's going to bring us and God into oneness. No more separateness. Our book says the great reality is deep down within. We're going about to go in. We're going to touch that. Now, when, my experience is once we get to figuratively touch God, the hand of God, we get ignited. That's why a book refers to us as being on fire. Something has changed once we touch God. And it's about to happen in 5, 6, and 7. Somewhere in there, we will get lit up. And by the time we finish the men's, we are on fire. We're new from the inside out. Eyes are the window to the soul. You will look at someone who's on fire. They don't have to say a word. You just know they're, regard, they're, they're lit up with God. You can see it. The same way like when I would come in and my eyes were dead. They were morbid. There was nothing going on. The flame wasn't turned on. I tried lots of things to get it. Had some instant gratification. Felt really good for a little while. And the next day was the guilt, remorse, and emotional hangover. This is permanent. God is God. And he's given away abundance all the time, pursuing me, pursuing you, pursuing every one of us, because we're all born to be saints. And we keep telling God, call me tomorrow. I'm busy today. And our book says, well, hold on a second. We're going to give you God right now. Are you willing to go to any lens here? Because the road's about to get really, really narrow. It got narrow in four. It's about to get really narrow when I'm about to share with you every the inner workings of my mind, every nook and cranny about me is about to get unloaded on you. That is a narrow walk and many of us will go away. And I still hope my sponsor would get sick. I would hope my sponsor would go away because I didn't want to go to his house. 25 years later, I do an inventory and about to do a fifth step. I still get squarely on the inside. I still get nervous. I still hope I my sponsor will forget. I know it's coming. I know the end result of it and still... I get uncomfortable because the ego is still breathing just a little bit. Because that guy doesn't want any part of this.
We have admitted certain defects, have ascertained in a rough way what the trouble is. We've put our finger on the weak items in our personal inventory. These are about to be cast out. We're not going to, I'm not going to work on my defects of character. I can't work on my defects of character. How can I work on my defects of character? Who's working on them? The same mind that created them. Can't solve a problem with the same broken mind that created it in the first place. So I can't work on my defects. I'm powerless. But I need power. And God will work on them in his time the way he sees fit. If it feels good, it doesn't mean it's good. If it feels bad, it doesn't mean it's bad. Some of the defects of car just need to be tweaked. It's an asset run, run amok. Some things need to be removed, not for me to judge, not for me to figure out. My job is to share everything with the sponsor. It says, this requires action on my part, which when completed will mean that I have admitted to God, to myself, and to another human being, the sponsor, the exact nature of my defects. The bottom of the page, it says, clear cut warning, if I skip this vital step, I may not overcome drinking. Vital. Life-giving when I do, and life-threatening if I don't. Like a vital organ I need, and if it's not there, I die. I may not overcome drinking. The old time used to tell us, do a fifth or drink one. Your choice. It says, having persevered with the rest of the program, we wondered why we fell. The reason is that we never completed our house cleaning. Step five is part of the house cleaning process. It, it, Bill split a lot of the six and seven up, eight and nine up, four and five up. We write and then we go deliver the work. It's two different steps, but it's one movement. When we complete step five, now we've completed the house cleaning. It tells me right there. So if I have a, an inventory, a book says a solitary self-appraisal is insufficient. I can write a beautiful fourth step and not share it anymore. It's just words on paper. And while I'm on that, a fourth step, according to my book, is not an autobiography. That's an exercise in ego and self. That I'm usually not afraid to share to anyone. If I have things on paper that I'm not too thrilled about sharing, probably did some work in that. It's a four-column inventory. Very specific format. Not an autobiography. And I don't need to list the good things I did. My book doesn't tell me to list the good things I did, because the good things I did are not going to get me drunk. Unless I go bragging about them. It's about the things that are blocking me, the obstacles that are blocking me from God. Isn't it interesting that the obstacles get so painful, the defects get so painful, that I actually get driven back to God? Sometimes the path of, with obstacles is the path to God. It is the road. The road full of obstacles is the road. I haven't met one person to come into A says it was a blast, I've had a great time, but I figured I'd come to A. <laughs> and I haven't met one person yet who I consider enlightened or gurus in AA who've said the last 20 or 30 or 40 years has been as smooth as anything. Bumps. Life comes at us. How we navigate through it is different. We will be revered and reviled walking around with this book in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know how many things I've gone to and put the big book down and the speakers and the people, some of the folks, oh no. And I've taken heat from people listening. And other people say, can you come back to speak? No attachments to any of that. Because I have to get attached to that. That means there's something wrong with me in here. I need to go home and do more work. Bottom of page 73, it says, we must be entirely honest with someone if we expect to live long and happily in this world. How long am I going to live? It's up to God. But how am I going to live it? What's my quality of life look like? How well am I? How am I doing? Can I take a poll of people who walk with me and get a good report card? Or I don't want anyone to even answer that question because I know how I am when I'm away from AA. How am I doing when I'm all alone? Fifth, one of the fifths that promises that we could be alone at perfect peace and ease. Can I be alone at perfect peace and ease? Am I up on time to get to work? Am I to bed at a, certain, a decent hour? Do I have a rhythm to my life? Meditating at a certain time? Praying at a certain time? Eating at a certain time? How am I doing? How's my money life look? Am I responsible with my bills? I don't mean a lot of money. Am I responsible with my bills? Or I couldn't care. Am I faithful in my relationships? Or she has to be faithful, but I don't. How am I April 15th? How am I going to do on April 15th when tax man comes around? Right? How am I doing? And if I'm still lying, cheating, and stealing, no sin. It just means that I'm still sick. 
Sin sometimes we look at is falling short, missing the mark. It's the action I'm taking that doesn't align with God's will. And here comes pain and suffering, not only to me, but to other people. I'm missing the mark. I'm falling asleep. So I do what I want to do. And the ego says, keep doing it. It's okay. And what the great thing that happens, the thing that's happened to me, is as I got through step five and moved through six and seven into amends and got away from that old life, I realized I'm running away from a case of mistaken identity. I thought that that was my life. My ego gave me my identity. Any money I had was my identity. What I drove, what, who I went with, that was my identity. All false. And the further I get away from that, as self starts to die, I realize what a great thing I'm running away from from a case of mistaken identity to get what God created at the beginning, broken and all. There's freedom in that. There's great freedom in knowing I will never be perfect unless God says you're going to be perfect. But do I strive every day to know my creator and do his work and align my will with his? Yes. That's a home run for people like us. I'm out of the perfect business. Now I really believe in all our brokenness. If if God came down from the heavens and walked in this room and went up to one of us and said, listen, I have a special mission for you to do. And to do that mission, you have to be completely perfect, defect free, perfect, like me. Is it possible? Most of you absolutely not. Then how small is your God? I have, for me, I have to say, well, yeah, it's possible. And we're talking about God. We're talking about the boss here. Who breathes breath into me to, to live. Of course it's possible. So can he relieve me of my alcoholism and defects of character? In his time, yes. He's relieved me of my alcoholism. It says, when we decide who's to hear our story, we waste no time. I have a written inventory prepared for a long talk. I explain to my partner, my sponsor, what I'm about to do. And if they're, they're in this book, they know exactly what we're doing. Most folks in AA know what a fifth step looks like and what they're supposed to be doing. If they're in the big book, they know absolutely what we're about to do. They know how vulnerable. When men come to me, my sponsees, when they come to me, I know they're sick, they're uncomfortable, they're nervous. They start talking about a whole bunch of things right away. You're trying to delay the whole process. Are you feel you're, you're okay today, Pete? You're all right. We can postpone this if you want. You know. <laughs> because I do the same thing. They're nervous. And the way my teachers embraced that and didn't criticize me, made me comfortable, I do that for the men too. Because I know they're engaged upon a life and death. Errand. That's the responsibility that God gave to us. That they're engaged upon a life and death errand. Think about that when we're here in the fifth step. Our book says it. We're engaged upon a life and death errand. Who does he give it to? Another drunk. And a life and death errand. Another drunk to help us go from here to here. He could have gave it to a lot of other people. He entrusted us with this gift and this gave us this power to take a drunk from death to life. Wow, what an order. We certainly can go through that one. But I better be have done my homework. It says we pocket our pride and go to it, illuminating every twisted character, every dark cranny of the past, and we stop there. What follows is the fifth step promises. Up until that point, we're preparing to go in. Now that there's a period, and we go in and we do our fifth step, however long that takes. Sometimes it'll take a few hours. Sometimes it'll take a few days. With me, I have about a two, three, maybe four-hour attention span. Then I go ADD. I can't pay attention. And it's a life and death there, and so I'm not just going to listen to you for the sake of listening to you. I will put, put a lid on it and come back. And James and I, we did it about three or four times together at the time. Because I, I stopped hearing. So I put a lid on it and come back next time, and we pick it up, and we keep going. And we keep going until we're done. What happens when we're done? This needs to be shared before we wrap. Fifth step promises, which... Might come right after five, might come in six and seven, might come in eight and nine. For me, I had an experience with this stuff in six and seven. It says, once having taken this step, withholding nothing, have I withheld anything? Sometimes we'll get to the car and we'll say, I didn't tell them about that. What I tell the men is this, after they leave my house, is you revealed a lot to me. And what will happen is I call it the boomerang. You throw something out and it comes back to you. 
You get in your car and as you're driving away, you, your mind's going to say, why'd you say that for? You didn't need to talk about that. That's the illness showing up again. One last shot at pulling us down. Pay no attention to that. Maybe there's something we forgot and it just comes to us because the ground is really fertile and we're done with a fifth step. Stuff is starting to pop. Just tell the sponsor, I just remembered something, not purposely forgetting, it just came to me. That's happened too with some men. But assuming we're all clear, it says, once having taken a step withholding nothing, we're delighted, we can look the world in the eye. I used to always look at my shoes all the time. Look the world in the eye. I can be alone in perfect peace and ease. Our fears fall from us. We begin to feel the nearness of our Creator. Oneness. We may have had certain spiritual beliefs, but now we begin to have a spiritual experience. And it might be the infancy of the experience, but it's happening. It's happening. We're new, right here. The feeling that the drink problem has disappeared will often come strongly so much for, it's normal to think about a drink because I'm an alcoholic. I don't need to think about drinking anymore. Not if God's done what God's done, and I've been thorough, why would God keep me walking around with a loaded pistol to my head thinking about drinking? If I think about it long enough, I'm going to get drunk. If I go to the barbershop, hang around long enough, I'm going to get a haircut. But God removes it. It's a great promise. I remember a guy telling me, hey, it's always, it's normal to think about a drink. You're an alcoholic. And my sponsor pointed out, yeah, if you're untreated, but if we're spiritually fit, I don't need to think about drinking unless I'm doing a 12-step call or I'm sponsoring someone and I want to share my story with them so they identify with me. <laughs> other than that, I'm not walking around thinking about drinking during the day or doing any other, anything else. The feeling that the drink problems disappear will often come strongly. We feel on the broad highway walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe, oneness. I was at a meeting uh, in Brooklyn. Friday night, Bad Beach Group. Finished my fifth step. Got my instructions to six and seven. Everyone's talking about these fifth step promises. I'm just feeling relieved I'm done. Friday night, I'm walking up the steps. I got to the second floor, and boom. When God shows up, God shows up. Sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. When God shows up, God shows up. It's profound. It's life-changing. It's, it's like the most unexpected transformational event you'll experience. You don't expect God to show up. He just shows up. And I knew something was going on, but I didn't know it was this. And I spoke to a senior member in the group who's a big book person. I said, here's what's going on. He said, you need to call your sponsor, but I'll tell you what's going on. God's going on. That's what's going on. It was euphoric. Everything was right. Everything was right in my world that night. I don't remember the meeting till this day. Every Friday night I was there. I was lit up. It happened in 6 and 7, which rocketed me into 8 and 9, which pushed me into 10 and 11, which allowed me to be of service to others, which the whole thing's all about anyway. Once we get God... The lost sheep, bring him back. The lost sheep, bring him back. Bring our children, bring God's children back to God. I mean, that's what we're supposed to be doing here. There's many of them, maybe in this room. I can't transmit something I haven't gotten. I will what I do. Untreated alcoholism or an awakened spirit. And when we're awake, we don't have to say much. What we're doing speaks so loud, you can't hear a word we're saying. Huh? That's all I got. Peace. My name is Peter, I'm a recovered alcoholic. Yeah. I'm grateful to be alive and sober and part of the safety place called Alcoholics Anonymous. And again, thank uh, you guys for having me up here uh, to share my experience, strength, and hope. Uh, God separated me from alcohol June 23rd, 1988. Uh, I get to share with you that I'm a recovered alcoholic because that's been made my truth. And um, anything less than that would be falsely humble. Uh, June 23rd, 1988, uh, God separated me from alcohol for the last time. Um, I'm okay with saying the last time. I'm okay with saying the seven treatment center was my last treatment center uh, because I get to experience a day to time permanent sobriety in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, relapse is not a requirement for recovery. I know there's some people out there that talk about that, that relapse is, a, is a, a part of recovery, and that's just nonsense. It's not in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. We bottom out, we surrender, and God does for us what we can do for ourselves. And 
So uh, my last treatment center was in 1988. I entered treatment June 23rd, 1988, after six treatment centers. And um, I really wasn't sure if this thing called recovery was going to be a part of my life. Because the voice in my head kept telling me, who are you kidding? And um, about six months, almost six months uh, into um, recovery, I was recovering. I wasn't recovered. And I wasn't using and I looked like a drunk without a drink in me. And I was behaving many times inappropriately. And I didn't have meeting etiquette. I didn't have social etiquette. I didn't even know what etiquette was. You know, it was all about me all the time. No matter what was going on, it was about me. And I maybe would sit in the meeting, have my hand up, but they didn't pick on me. So I, I uh, uh, gossip about the speaker that they didn't call on. It was always about me. If I walked into a room, I felt everyone was looking at me. When I left the room, I thought they were all talking about me. And I was in total bondage. On December 22nd, 1988, a day shy of my six-month AA birthday, um, I was uh, looking to drink. And I wanted to drink. And the only thing that kept me from drinking was this power called God, because God wanted me sober. And um, I was going to drink, and I I planned it. And if I didn't drink, I was going to get some dry goods. I just couldn't take the pain of being sober without any kind of solution. And I was making meetings. And I found out the lessons in that much later on, that meetings don't treat alcoholism. God could have would if he was sought. And uh, I remember uh, making the prayer. I was driving in a rent a wreck in, uh, so they call it a rent a wreck in Minnesota. I was driving down something called Washington Avenue. Um, and it wasn't the best part of Minneapolis. And there I was, and I'm thinking, well, I'm going to go into a bar and just get a double, man, and just, you know, wash the night away, because this, this is just god-awful. And who am I kidding? And um, I didn't do that. I went to the next block and to the next block, and I had the thought about seeing this guy uh, who was helping me. I said, well, get on the express if I get to his house, and when I get off, I'll stop in a bar. If anyone's dealing, I'll, I'm just going to get something. I need something. And uh, next thing I know, I'm knocking on his door. And I've shared this story from a million of these podiums, uh, and I, he opened the door and let me in, and I told him my tales of woe. Now, uh, those of us who have been around a while know what newcomers are like, right? You say hello, and they talk for the next two hours. And they just keep talking, and they keep talking, and they start off here, and you wind up there, and that's what I did. And when I finally came up for air, he says, where are you with God in the 12 steps? And I says, when do you start the steps? And he says, when you stop throwing up and you're late. And he was firm, right between the eyes, and he didn't care if I got annoyed or my feelings were hurt. I didn't need a process group when I was done. Uh, I didn't have to go see my counselor, call my my sponsor, because this guy was my teacher, and I didn't like the answer. What I wanted was a hug. Let's go to the diner. Let's read page 449 about acceptance. And uh, I was annoyed by him, but he gave me truth. And the thing is, I'd rather be accused of telling someone the truth than be accused of telling someone a lie. And when it comes to this thing, I ruffle feathers many times in my day, purposely and unintentionally, but I don't care. Because someone's got to tell us the truth. And I'm very grateful to teachers who just level me. My first sponsor was a, was a drill sergeant. And he would drop the F-bomb like I would eat M&M's if he just didn't care. But that's the way he delivered the message. And my second sponsor would had a little cleaner language, but he lowered the boom at any given opportunity. Because I can't see my illness running my life. Other people can. And the last thing I need after 25 years of sobriety is someone co-signing my nonsense. It's the last thing I need because then they're guilty of killing me. So that's how this went for me. And uh, I went home and uh, I started reading this big book and started praying. And uh, there was one particular day uh, I was in Minneapolis and it was shortly before I came home. Now I've been told by this man and many others Make sure I pray. And it doesn't only have to be praying in the morning and praying in the evening. If we pray, conscious contact and constant contact with God. It's the only thing I got blocking me from another drink. And I'm experiencing grace at that point. What I need to experience the power that gives me grace. And that's what I was lacking. And uh, it was uh, maybe April-ish. And um, I was uh, due to come home. And I'm out there now about 10 or 11 months or so. And it's still snowing in Minneapolis. There's like 14,000 feet of snow outside. It's sub-zero temperature. And I'm like, I'm feeling really alone. I can't get to a meeting. It's on way on the other side of town. I don't know how to get there. There's a snowstorm out, and I'm feeling it. I'm alone. 
not alone like I like to be alone now, but lonely. And the walls, the room, the, it seemed like the walls of the room were come getting closer and closer and closer. And I was getting uncomfortable. I was getting very, very uncomfortable. And then the voices of the AA members came to me, including this one guy. And that was hit my knees and pray. And after prayer was to get to a meeting, which I was going to plan on doing that night. I couldn't get to one then. And the other thing was to read my big book. And they didn't say, where? I just read your big book. And I opened up to the chapter of vision for you. And so I began reading from the beginning. And many of us are familiar with page 164. But by the time I got to page 164, I was crying. Out of gratitude. Out of relief. And I felt as if that kind of, that God presence now was in that room and the walls went back. And there was air back in my lungs. And I know this sounds silly until you've experienced this. I felt like the founding members were kind of circled around me. Bill and Bob and, and Chuck Chamberlain and Bill Dutton, they were all there for me. For me, only me. And I got through that day, got over that hurdle. And another hurdle, another hurdle, and so on and so forth. So I got to experience that sometimes when we are in what appears to be uh, the moments of desperation, when we really feel alone and there's nowhere to turn, what an opportunity God has presented to us, although it doesn't feel good, to develop a relationship with God. And over the years, my most difficult times seem to be the most intimate times with God. I'm real serious, girls. This is not no joke. Okay. I'm not a comedy routine. If you got to go outside and giggle it off, do it, because there's people dying. Yeah, I'm serious about that. Okay. What you're doing is bad as texting, and it's rude. Okay. <clears throat> My most difficult times in Alcoholics Anonymous on this path have been a present from God to turn back to him and develop a relationship with him. If it feels good, it doesn't mean it's good. If it feels bad, it doesn't mean it's bad. So some of the things that come to us are actually gifts from God to remove everything that's in the way. But it depends where I am, too, on this path. Am I in a place of compliance or surrender? Because if I'm in a place of compliance, I'm going to read the big book because you read the big book, and the group's reading the big book, and she and he's reading the big book, and maybe I can get a date because she's reading the big book, and I'll impress her with the big book, so this is good. But when it comes down to hitting the road, I'm in a place of compliance, not surrender, and it's going to kind of pan out after a while. It's going to just kind of fade away. It's fashionable. Everyone else is doing it, so I'll do it. But when I'm all alone, how am I doing? If I'm in a place of surrender... I don't need anyone around me to convince me to pray to God. I don't need anyone around me because I have not some extra time to read my big book. It's what I do. It's who we be. And it can be nothing standing in the way from my own experience between me and God. And I can't have any obstacles in the way between me and God. First off, if I put anything between me and God, I'm going to lose anyway. It's been my experience. And God will remove things too. Is my recovery one of inspiration? Am I inspired during the day? Am I inspired during the week? Do I inspire others? Or do I have a, a life of desperation? Inspiration or quiet desperation? Compliance or surrender? Have I gotten to a gut level that this is spiritual life or spiritual death? Because if I'm just getting my own spirit, if I'm just going to meetings like I did in my first six months, I'm going to meetings, but the spirit wasn't awakened. It was there. There was nothing igniting it. It was just me running on self-reliance, and I was criticizing and critiquing and judging and taking inventory and looking at things I shouldn't be looking at, and nothing was happening, so the meetings weren't treating me. I was in quiet desperation, but guess what? My ego was starting to flex its muscles, and my ego was preventing me from talking to anyone about, hey, I'm in trouble. I'm not feeling good. I'm thinking about drinking until December 22nd, 1988. And that was in that desperation, in the not feeling good, was God again scooping me up. Inspiration, desperation. Spiritual life, spiritual death. Compliance or surrender. Am I willing to go to any lengths that are on God's terms or any lengths that are on my terms? What's that look like? The process of recovery is one big removal. 
everything gets me removed. And the more that gets removed, it seems to be the healthier I get, the more weller I get, the more wellness I get to experience, the more God I get to experience. If there's something that I'm holding on to, it's going to be in the way between me and God. I've heard old timers say, God's a jealous God. You can't have another lover other than God, whatever it might be. And I need to surrender everything to it. The same thing held true for me when I hit my fourth step, which we talked about, and I touched on step five last week. There can be no reservations or a lurking notion when I'm doing this work. And the only way I can approach this work is through God. If I was trying to write my fourth step on my own, it wouldn't work. If I was trying to do my fifth step on my own, it wouldn't work. So I had to surrender to God. And I think a couple of weeks ago, I talked about writing this, beginning to write a fourth step without prayer. And I would get a lot of distractions or I wouldn't write. I'd write a little, justify, minimize, and then go to sleep. Or I wouldn't write. i get things in the way until I bottomed out with that. And then I told my sponsor about it. and He read me the riot act. And I started to pray before I write. And I would pray when I was done. And I was told to write a prayer across the top of the page. Thank you, God, for allowing me to be searching, fearless, and moral. And I get some quiet time, and suddenly the pen became the spiritual translator. I began to write resentment inventory, sex inventory, fear inventory, and so on. And suddenly I got done. And when I got done with the fourth step, I had like, I don't know, about five, four or five spiral notebooks worth of material. My sponsor said, what an order. He can't go through with it at that point. Right? <laughs> but there were some things that happened. And this is what I found out. Uh, each time I do inventory, um, we're writing the inventory, and we're going from point A to point B. But it's in the writing that the awakening happens. It's in the writing that uh, we start to experience God. In the wreckage, in the middle of all that writing, is when that relationship starts to blossom or even form. When I'm in the middle of the fourth column of resentment inventory and I see there's no way out, I'm going to God, I'm writing, I'm thanking God, I'm going to God, I'm writing, I'm thanking God, and that's all I'm thinking about, and I'm asking questions about it. I'm all in. Tremendous growth happens. It doesn't feel like it, but it does. If it, does, if it feels good, it doesn't mean it's good. If it feels bad, it doesn't mean it's bad. And when I'm writing inventory, it doesn't feel so good. I'm taking stock of me for the first time in my life. In fact, every time I write inventory, I get a new magnifying glass and I focus in on me. I mean, it's really funny. We love to talk about, it's always about me. Alcoholics love to talk about us, it's always about me. No matter what's going on, it's about me. And then we get inventory where it's really all about you, and we don't do it. Right? It's my inventory, not yours. It's my resentment, not yours. It's my third column, not yours. And we all do it tomorrow. But they ask me to talk about myself, I'll do it all night. Really, through God's uh, grace, I got done with the fourth step. And last week, we talked about step five as to what that was going to look like. It's a couple of things uh, that I experienced during my fourth step, and that was intimacy. Intimacy not with another person, but int intimacy with God for the first time. I was trusting and relying upon God. It was a part of me that was had one foot in, like, this is going to work because it worked for my sponsor. I wasn't even looking at other AA members. My sponsor did it. He swore by it. He's my hero, so I'm going to do it. The other foot was in, who are you kidding? You're a chronic relapser. Sooner or later, you're going to blow this up anyway. And Penn kept going to paper, and I kept writing and writing and writing. And the intimacy, uh, 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 this relationship with God started to kind of blossom for the first time. I was experiencing something I didn't experience before. And I look back on this many times, how although I didn't feel it while I was writing inventory, but my relationship started to change. The edges I was walking around with were getting sanded down. The ego, little by slowly, was getting grinded into dust to just the process of writing. I haven't even shared anything yet. Now, it didn't feel that way when I was writing inventory. When I come to a fourth column, even now, who wants to look at a fourth column? In the 12 and 12, it says, who cares to admit complete defeat in step one? I could apply that line to our fourth column. Who wants to take only my, 
my inventory, our own inventory, and disregard what you did entirely. My whole life has been, I know I'm a little bit to blame, but you really are to blame. In fact, if you didn't do this, I wouldn't have done that. Right? That's how most AA meetings are later, right? Let's talk about ourselves, but we're going to blame somebody during our share at some point. If she didn't do this, if he didn't do that, my sponsor didn't do that, and it goes on and on. My sponsor's the greatest sponsor in the world. I can't believe I got Joe Smith as my sponsor, and two weeks later, I dumped him. He's a nut. Why? Because he gave me step work. So he's the bad guy. And that's how we operate. The last thing I need to do is hear from someone truth, because I always live in a lie. I love the lie. I can improvise on a lie, but not when it comes to truth. Truth is the truth. That's it. There's no left or right, there's truth. And um, I'm writing and I'm developing this thing with God, but it didn't feel that way. This relationship and total dependence upon God. Because I, I, I might not be the brightest bulb in the box, but I know what's coming next. I'm going to share all of this stuff. I know there's a fifth step and he's waiting for me. And my first sponsor was brutal. And I know he's going to get it. And who's going to hear the sex inventory? Him. Oh my God. How am I going to share this with another guy? And so the wheels were already spinning, but somehow God kept pushing the pen, and it became this spiritual translator. Go figure. I didn't need a college university degree to write an inventory. I didn't need to worry about my feelings and my issues and my triggers and all that other therapeutic stuff to write inventory. I just needed a notepad, a pen, and God, and off I went. And I started to write, and the pen started to move kind of just started to move, and truth was revealed over and over and over again. Now, the truth doesn't feel good when it first comes out. There's a tremendous amount of uh, freedom in fear. There's a lot of pain in the lie, although when I lie quickly, it's nice, quick. I got you off my back. I just made you believe something that's not true, and I feel good about me, and 10 minutes later, it's barking at me again. The truth doesn't always feel good, especially it's about me, because it means I have to t reveal everything to you. And the only way that was possible for someone like me, who was constantly lying, was God. So the, 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 the relationship with this power called God was developing right away. Although it doesn't feel like it comes to fruition until maybe we're in 9, maybe 6 and 7, maybe in 10 and 11. But it's certainly there. So if anyone's writing inventory, inventory doesn't feel good. If you're writing inventory and it feels really good, you're not writing inventory. You're writing an autobiography. Well, you're writing all the good things about me, too. You hear this one that goes around, write about the bad things and the good things about you. That's therapeutic nonsense that kills people like us. The last thing my ego needs to know is how good it was when I was out there. And I, I did do some good things when I was drinking. I did no good things when I was drinking. Next. Right? Now, the ego doesn't want any part of that. The ego wants no part of that. The ego wants to get stroked just a little bit. Just to put me in the corner for a little while so I come back. And so what 4 and 5, actually 4 through 9 does is rip the ego and grind it into dust if we're doing this work. Will it reemerge? Absolutely. Depending on how diligent I am in 10, 11, and 12 and reworking the steps and growing and understanding and effectiveness. This is, I'm never cured of this thing. Get recovered, yeah, but never cured. Alcoholism will go lay in wait in the next room. It'll wait 5 years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. It'll lay in wait. You don't need to write inventory. You're good. You don't need to call your speaker. You don't even need a sponsor. Yeah. Just check in with your sponsor. I love this one. If you're my sponsor. Just call or check in. I'm not the holiday in. Don't check in. All right. So I get done with this War and Peace novel. And as I shared last week, it was about going to my sponsor now. And I know there's stuff in there that he's going to hear that I'm not that I am uncomfortable with. I mean, God pushed the pen, put down a sex inventory, put down a fear inventory, put down a principles, institutions inventory, put down a resentment inventory, and some of it was okay. You know, resentment, Joe, he did this. Resentment, Mary, she did that. When it came to other things, starting with the major resentments I had with my mom and my dad, that was shameful. You know, how ungrateful am I that I'm going to write about mom? Mom's dead. How can I write about mom? Mom overdosed. Mom committed suicide. How can I have a resentment with this woman? But they were plenty. Sex inventory. I'm a man. No one knows about this. I'm just a stud. Let's get that straight right from the beginning, right? What are you laughing at me for? <laughs> Guys, you know what I'm talking about. 
were men, were men, men among men. We have no secrets. Not true. <laughs> we were faithful in every relationship. Not true. Somebody's going to hear this. And other things. And who was I going to tell about some of the sexual abuse things I was a victim of? Because if I told you that, you probably, this is my judgmentalist, if I tell you this, you're going to probably think I'm different. Maybe I'm not heterosexual because I was sexually abused between ages 8 and 10. You might think it was my fault. I'm judging you. You didn't do anything. I'm already sizing you up. So no one's going to talk about that. Let's keep that one there. And I go back into bondage. And I knew this stuff was coming. How do I share this? And this is why sponsorship, not for the obvious, you have to get a sponsor because that's what they tell us to do. And that's what most people work on. I have to get a sponsor to satisfy the masses. We get a sponsor because he's our teacher. She's our teacher. It's a God, one of God's angels who knows when you have walked to get in there and pull you out of the mud and can read you when you're feeling ashamed. Can feel, can feel the anger in you when it's starting to build up and you're talking to them and just knows by looking at your eyes you're full of baloney. They are a spiritual teacher. And as brutal as my first sponsor was, he was a guru. He read me as soon as I walked in the room. And what he did during the very delicate, sensitive issues in step five, he knew where I was. And I would mumble. The, the writing was scribbled on the page. And he says, how much shame and embarrassment do you have feeling about this? Let's go home and write about that. He was a teacher. And sponsors are teachers. And if your sponsor's not teaching, get a new sponsor. If, co if your sponsor's co-signing your illness, get a new sponsor. Sponsor's a teacher who's walked the same road, maybe a different town, maybe a different tax bracket, maybe a different color, different religion, but has walked the alcoholic road, knows where you are before you even get there, and pulls you and, and, and teaches you and instructs you and puts you back together. That's God's work. Step five is really proof of the great love God has for people like us. Because he could have sent this off to, we could be sitting in a shrink's office, getting medicated and being in therapy for the next 30 years, and drinking the whole time. He could have sent us to a, 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 a medical doctor, uh, institutions. There's many, many more qualified people than us who know about the inner workings of the mind. But he gave this to another drunk, which we read at the end of the meeting anyway. Great power that God had in us, to give us. So we're working with someone and because they, they know the walk. You know how you can smell a drunk? I don't mean literally smell, but you just, this guy's an AI. Did you ever do that? You're talking to someone, and this guy definitely an AI. I know he is, and sure as anything he is. Right? Or sometimes you go, this guy needs to be an AI. Yeah, right? <laughs> Fort Lauderdale, that happens a lot. <laughs> but that's that, that, that quiet voice, that sixth sense that our book talks about. And my thing has been for years, I mean, we know of five senses God gave us. A book refers to the sixth sense. And I've always said this, and I'm probably wrong, but I'll still believe it, that God really gave us the sixth sense. We talk about five, they're very tangible. We know the five, they're very tangible. This sixth sense is that intuitiveness. This, that, that thing where you just know. Somehow you just know. I can smell a drunk. I sense this person is in pain. I sense this person is lying. I just did something. Or you're hearing the fifth step, and you know there's more to this, and somehow words come out of your mouth. You ask a question that you're amazed that you have the insight to even ask that question. That's the God track. Step five is a very powerful thing. If you haven't done one or heard it, it's incredible what goes on because it's just as nourishing for the listener as it is to the person sharing it. But we have to listen and go in with the drunk and guide them and steer them and coddle and sometimes just call them on the nonsense, which was all done for me. It's still done for me. My teachers say, bullshit. That's not you. Go home and rewrite that. And I would, only because I didn't want to go back to where I was. My first fifth step experience was interesting because when it came to the sex inventory, um, I thought my sponsor was going to throw me out of his house. Um, I had um, abuse issues, I had anger issues, I was never faithful in a relationship, and I thought he was going to judge me. And when I read it, 
he shared some of his stuff with me. That was almost like it paralleled. And when it came to the sexual abuse stuff, I saw my guys that think I'm less than a man. They think I, you know, what, what I did here. And he shared almost identical stuff happened to him around the same age from a relative. <sighs> Thank you, God. And how he navigated, how he was able to get navigated out of that and heal that. Incredible stuff that goes on in step five. What I found out is I do the one through nine at least once a year. To kill the ego, to kill self for successful living. Because the ego will reconstruct, it will rebuild. And I can't have a current experience off an old experience. I can't, uh, I didn't get full, I don't stay full today on yesterday's food. So I have to constantly get my soul full, constantly nourish the spirit. Which means the death of self for successful living, the killing off of the ego. So I can be present. If I'm not present, it's because I'm driven by voices from the past. And if I'm driven by voices from the past, I still have unreconciled issues that need to be reconciled, need to be healed, so I can be present and then move forward. Because what I'm saying right now, if I'm still living in the past, is based on old belief systems. They're useless to you. They're useless to me. My behavior, who I be, is based on old stuff that's never been resolved, never been healed. So I'm, even though I'm in front of you talking to you, I'm not in front of you talking to you. You have an old guy still here with you now. I'm unreliable. I'm trying to give you something that happened to me maybe in AA 10, 15 years ago. Oh, when I got sober, oh, when I went through the work, that's useless to me right now. Where are you currently? Were you sober and angelic 10 years ago and now you're a horse thief now? I don't need to talk to you now. I was honest in my relationships. I paid my taxes my first year of sobriety. Now I'm wanted by 30 states. I mean, you don't need me as a sponsor. Where are we currently? That's something to take a, take a look at. Where are we currently in the work? Where are we currently with our, in our relationship with God? Where am I currently with the people I sponsor? Currently with my sponsor. Where am I currently? Where do I stand tonight? Do I have a sponsor? Do I sponsor men? When did I pray last? When did I last write inventory? When did I read my big book or some inspirational literature? How honest have I been with the, with the most uh, uh, influential person in my life? Perhaps my sponsor. Or do I tell my sponsor a little bit, but not everything? And they get off the phone and say, I have a sponsor. That's called compliance. Can I un uh, 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 reveal everything to my sponsor? And everything means everything whether it's an inventory or a discussion. And do I do that regularly or do it once in a while when the flame's on my back again? Step five, last, last week we shared about some of the promises on page uh, 75. And it says, uh, returning home, we find a place where we can be quiet for an hour. This is after the promises. It says, we thank God from the bottom of our heart that we know him better. Taking this book down from the shelf, we turn to the page which contains the 12 steps. It says, we read through the five steps and we ask ourselves some questions. Have we omitted anything? Is our work solid? Are the stones properly in place? Have we skipped on the cement put into the foundation? Have we tried to make mortar without sand? What Bill is doing over and over again is asking the same question. But he knows how we are. We'll find a loophole in everything. So Bill threw it out this way, threw it out that way, threw it out this way, threw it out that way to kind of close up the loopholes. And what he's asking simply, have you left anything out, Pete? Purposely? Or did you forget something when you got home after the hour? Are we clear? Is everything on board? And he gives us that last opportunity before we go into six and seven. Are we clear? Have we been truthful? And what happens is sometimes we get back into the car and we say, oh, I didn't talk about that. The problem is we've, we've awakened a little bit. We can't get away with that anymore. It's way too painful. The stuff I could get away with in my first six months would kill me right now. Or perhaps we get home and in the quiet hour, something gets revealed to us that says, oh, I just thought of something. So we call up the sponsor, I just thought about something. And he'll tell me to write it, and then I report back to him. And what I did with, with these questions uh, on page 75, I go through the first uh, four steps just to kind of close up some more loopholes based on my experience with some people that I've sponsored. 
And simply, these questions that I have are about asking, have we been really thorough about everything? Am I clear on step one? Because the book says we looked at the first five proposals. Am I really clear that after completing my fifth step, I know I'm an alcoholic and my life's unmanageable, drunk or sober? I have no power, choice, control, drunk or sober. Am I clear that this power is going to take me to a place of sanity, wholeness of mind, a new relationship with God, where the insane thoughts aren't coming back anymore, not only with booze, but perhaps with the sex spree, the food spree, the money spree, the spree? Am I clear that I have to turn things over to God, or the illness will pull me right back? Have I been searching fearless and moral, or just a little bit? You know, just tell him a little, give him a little, give him a little taste of my life, but not the whole thing. And not until that point can I move on. One of the great things revealed to me a couple of weeks ago, I was talking about this, this image, the image I portrayed for you, and the image I would have to keep going for the voice in my head, that no matter what I put on for clothes, no matter what I drove, no matter who I dated, no matter where I lived, the voice would say, that's it? Look at you. You're still you. You're a loser. You're a failure. You're not much of a man. You don't have enough money. And it went on and on and on. So I would go out there and try to get more to satisfy the voice in the head. This process of recovery, I've said from a million podiums, is about going home. Someone put it more clearly. It's a forward journey backwards. It's a forward journey. We're going through the steps, and we're obviously making progress under the guidance of a teacher, a sponsor, following the instructions in the big book. And here we are. We're starting to evolve. We're starting to wake, and things are starting to fall by the wayside. The ego's starting to get grinded into dust. Self is starting to die, and we appear to be going forward. In reality, what we're doing is we're going home. It's a forward journey backwards, backwards to what God created at the beginning. Pure, honest, unselfish, and loving. Like a three-year-old. And guess what? For me in front of my God, I better be like a child in front of God. I better be that impressionable with God. I better be that amazed about the miracles of God. And not look at God or others with a tainted view anymore. That's being childlike. And that's how I want to be. Walking around a 53-year-old. How old am I? 53? 50? Uh, I'm too old. I don't want to be too smart for my own good. I want to have a beginner's mind. I want to be childlike which is how I need to be. There's another book that talks about that. We go home. The process of recovery is removal, never addition, and we go home to what God created, purity, honesty, and selfishness and love. And my life has been one of putting these bandages around this empty shell. Bandages in relationships, bandages in money, bandages in cars, bandages in a job, bandages in advancement, improvement, educate, whatever it was. Just give me something to fill up this nothing. And it works for a little while. When I drive up in a brand new car, you look at me, I've arrived, I have a new Cadillac, I'm somebody. And I'm now with the new car, you better come over and say, you're somebody. Because i got to trade the car in tomorrow morning if it doesn't work. And then you drive by in a new Mercedes, and suddenly my Cadillac looks like a pair of roller skates, and I'm back to scratch again. I gotta buy the bigger house. I gotta do, I gotta do. And I'm putting these bandages of the external world on this empty shell, and it doesn't work. It's an exercise of futility. And the interesting thing happens once we lock into God. I don't need any of that. It's nice to have, but I don't need. I'm not dependent upon that. External conditions are never a remedy for the internal illness that's killing me. And I keep getting, as one gentleman, uh, one of my teachers says, we spend money we don't have to buy things we don't need to impress people we don't like. That's me. And please applaud. Please say great things about me. Please say you love me. If you like me, that's not enough. Say you love me with a certain inflection on cue. Then we'll be okay. It's a forward journey backwards. And I keep putting these bandages around me, and that's what I learned in step five. Empty on the inside, and I need stuff to make me feel okay. Or okayness within. Fix this insecurity rather than being secure within. It's one big lie I was living my entire life, always reaching out and trying to fill up. And I put these unrealistic expectations on people. I learned that in every inventory. Even the last inventory did. These unrealistic expectations on people for one reason, to make me feel okay. 
to give me what I want. And if you don't, I gossip about your character sass, and they won't talk to you, snub you. I'd be suspicious of you. And God forbid you were to give me truth and hit me between the eyes. I don't talk to you anymore. Accountability to a sponsor really separates the men from the boys and the girls from the women. I got done with step five, went home for the hour. I looked at these considerations. And I didn't experience the fifth step promises until I was in step six and seven. And then it kind of blew up for me in nine where everything looked different. Everything looked different. Everything felt different. I went home. My bartender, I'm busy. Going back to purity, honesty, unselfishness, and love. I couldn't do that on my best day, on my own power. But something happens in the removal of self. So I finished the hour. I answered these questions. And I got to sit for that hour. And um, I moved on to six and seven. Now, it's an interesting story I like to tell uh, when I do this stuff about what happened to me um, going through the work a handful of times. I have an experience with six and seven that was really pivotal for me. And it was delivered to me by God. Remember, if it feels good, doesn't mean it's good. If it feels bad, it doesn't mean it's bad. And here I am in step six, looking at the considerations um, and moving on to the seven-step prayer. And uh, I went into meditation. And I was, uh, something came to me in meditation, and it was a prayer. And the prayer was, God, please save me from me. Because what I realized, it was truth was given to me in the stillness, God will speak and we can hear. We go into to, to darkness to see and silence to hear. And I was made abundantly aware that the biggest guy in the bar wasn't going to hurt me. The most vicious drug dealer wasn't going to hurt me. The IRS or the cops weren't going to hurt me. What was going to hurt me was me. I'm my own worst enemy. That was a tough pill to swallow because it was much easier to say, hey, it's your fault the reason why it turned out the way it did. And if you would have done that, I would have been different. It was me. I'm my own worst enemy. God's please save me from me. Then I start to feel really uncomfortable. I start to feel physically ill. I felt like I was vibrating on the inside. I felt as if I'd never been to an AA meeting in my life. There were no thoughts about drinking, but I felt raw, like a raw nerve, sitting in as a meeting, of, as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Like I didn't have a sponsor. Exposed. Oh, my God. I didn't know what to do with that. And I was shaking, I remember shaking butterflies. And I called up my sponsor and I told, I says, Mark, here's what's going on. And I'll never forget what he did. He says, it sounds like you're having an experience and hung up the phone. It's exactly what he did. Kind of what, what Silky did with Bill. It's better than what you have and walked out. He didn't have a group for him. Well, let's talk about, Pete, what you're feeling right now can't be true. Let's, let's, let's talk about your feelings. You have her. He just says, better when you, and hung up the phone. Sounds like having an experience hung up the phone. He was right. He did He was big enough and awake enough not to get in the middle of that God experience. If it feels good, doesn't mean it's good. If it feels bad, doesn't mean it's bad. What I was experiencing, looking back on it now, was what we talk about a lot in AA, is the death of self is successful living. That self has to die, and that's what was going on. That didn't feel good. Everything I thought was me, everything I thought was God, everything I thought was AA was being squashed down to nothing. So what would emerge out of that was what God created at the beginning. It was incredibly uncomfortable. There was something that took place in my home that Sunday, and every fiber of my being wanted to put my hands on the wheel and control the outcome. And go back to doing what I was doing. And as if it was as if this field came down, this force field, and wouldn't allow me to do what I wanted to do coming out of my mind, the predator. And I was placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. And a day later I was so glad I didn't get involved because it would have been made worse. And that was the beginning, the infancy of this new experience with God, a deeper relationship with God. When we're going in with God, when we're having, when I'm having a relationship with God, sometimes I'm not even aware it's going on. All I know is lots of times I'm made very uncomfortable because the dismantling of the self and the ego is taking place. I cannot have a relationship with God when ego is in the middle of it. I cannot have a relationship with God when I'm in the middle of it. When I do these talks, I hope I don't show up. It's just God and me, the spirit, and nothing can be in between. 
And if there is, what I have is a false god. My car is my god. My relationship is my god. My money is my god. Oh, and then there's God. Everything got removed. And another gift from God. And when we go in with God, when we start to develop this intimate relationship with God, it isn't always wonderful. It can be uncomfortable. God's not making us uncomfortable. We're uncomfortable because I was experiencing the grinding of the ego into dust in the depth of self. That doesn't feel good. Everything I thought was me is not me. Everything I thought was God is not God. In fact, anything my mind comes up with that says this God, it's not God. But this power can be experienced. Work with a drunk intensely. You'll experience God. A lot of aggravation, but you'll experience God. Everything I thought my life was supposed to look like was revealed to me. No, it is not. I thought I was supposed to be doing certain things. No, you're not. I thought I was supposed to have so much money by now. No, you're not. God gives me the money to play with. God gives me the job to go work. God gives me the car. God puts people in my life. It's none of my business. My business is having a relationship with God. And I've been giving 12 steps. What I don't get lots of times, and I was guilty of it my first six months, we come into Alcoholics Anonymous, a sacred place called Alcoholics Anonymous. We have an abundance of information and an abundance of teachers. People from other fellowships leave their fellowships to come to AA. Because of this book and our message. And so many of us are dying in AA saying, I didn't get sober. They weren't talking about the book. You ain't looking. I don't know about you, but when I was using dry goods and I went to my spot and no one was there, I didn't go home. I found another spot. Oh, my home group has changed. I'm leaving. I'm taking my ball and going home. So I got done with the fifth step and uh, we got to six and seven, which is on page 76. If I don't turn to God and have God deal or work on my defects, my defects will work and deal with me. One of the things I got to look at through inventory is how many of my defects are fueled by fear, all of them. And the defects give birth to other defects. Defects beget defects. And only God can remove them. I can't work on my defects. Can't work. I'm working on my defects. Good luck. Because the same mind that creates the defects is the same mind that you think, I think, is going to do away with them. It's what uh, uh, has free room and board in my mind. All my defects. They don't want to move. I can't work on them. What step six says is I hit my knees. Step seven says I do a prayer and I become willing. As Bill says, root and branch to be changed. It's none of my business how I'm going to be changed. Some of the defects, I think, have to be removed. And God says, no, they just need to be tweaked. What I think is good might be bad. What I think is bad might be good. It's none of my business, but it's a surrender. And step six asks us some questions. It says, are we ready to uh, let God remove from us all the things which we admitted are objectionable? All. Can God take them all, every one? He better. Because I'm I'm in serious trouble if he doesn't. It says at the beginning of step six something very key that sometimes we can roll right over. It opens up step six and says, if we can answer to our own satisfaction, the question is on page 75. We look at step six. If we can answer to our own satisfaction. It's very interesting. Because there's been a shift. Step six and seven, we can do alone. We don't need someone standing over us. It's between me and God. If we can answer to our satisfaction, we then look at step six. It tells me, am I clear at a gut level that I've been searching for us and all across the board here? If I answer these questions, yes, I move into step seven, which is really an extension of step three, prayer. There's an amen here. And we're going to God once again to remove good and bad because it's not my business but I think is good might be bad and vice versa and the seven step prayer is not about me it's about being of maximum service to God the people around us to be clean some more to be shaped some more the touch of the master's hand because I'm about now to go out there and repair with God's power and there's an amen at the end of the seven step prayer we've closed up this body of work of going in and searching And next week we'll talk more about it. I'm out of time. Thank you.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.